We acknowledge the Yuggera and Ghana nations as traditional custodians of the land on which we work, live and learn, and their continuing connection with the land, waters and community. We pay our respects to them and their elders past and present. All content related to this program is for general informational purposes only and contains stories and discussion around mental health that may be disturbing to some listeners. If you are concerned about yourself or someone you know, please seek professional and individual advice and support. More details are contained in our show notes. Thanks for your attention today, everyone. It's been a great meeting. One more thing before we go. I just want you to join me in congratulating Imposter for taking out the annual Employee Innovation Challenge. And as you know, the prize is a promotion into the leadership team. Well done, Imposter. Um, thanks. Time to get back to the floor, everyone. Uh, Imposter, can you stay back a minute for me, please? Um, yeah. Yep. Get ready for it. This is the bit where he says you're only a temporary team leader. What? Wait. Who are you? I'm that little voice that gives you a reality check. Devil's Advocate. Devil, for sure. <sighs> yeah, well, you're probably right. It's not like my idea was really all that original. You did right there, sister. Imagine if you'd spent some actual time on it. Hang on. Who are you? Your inner crap detector. When nothing short of perfect will do. And I don't need to tell you that that was far from perfect. Awesome job, imposter. How does it feel to reap the rewards of your hard work? You know know you're just a quota, right? right? The The boys' boys club club just found a lady friend. Um, good, I think. Still a bit surprised, I can see. Yes. That's That's not all he's going to see when he bothers bothers to look properly. properly. Where did you come up with your idea? Here we go. He can can see see fraud fraud written all over over your face. face. Well, I just kind of compared our performance stats over the last 12 months and looked at the impact of things like camera use in Zoom meetings and activities in team meetings that let people connect with each other for a little while without a focus on the business. Oh my God, how much more more general can you get? And don't don't talk too much much about time time wasting on subjects subjects not related related to the the job. job. Well, it's paid off. He's lying. Some of the other leaders have been trying what you did and have had some amazing results with their teams. I'll bet they did better. What experience have you actually got? Great. So the first thing I'm going to get you to do is to write a job ad so you can backfill the position you're leaving. You'll never be able to do that properly. And whoever you hire is probably going to be way better at your job than you are. That wouldn't be hard. Your teammates already think they're better for the job. Guys, can you just ease up a minute? Um, <clears throat> would it be better to get one of the experienced guys to take the lead on that? No, no. It's a really good way of acknowledging just how much you've been doing and focusing in on the right qualities to look for when you're hiring. And showing him exactly what an imposter you actually are. Um, okay. Oh, uh, yep. Yeah, I will put something together and run it by you. No need. I trust you. Just send it to HR when it's ready. Well, this is going to take some work if HR were involved. Okay, thanks. Hey, <laughs> congratulations again. It's really great to see someone rewarded for the excellent work they do. You'll get a confirmation letter from HR about your promotion in the next couple of days. Don't hold your breath. Well, those voices were a bit too easy to conjure up, weren't they? (laughs) Ah, yeah, that's our internal monologues. And this is Reframe of Mind. The podcast that cuts through the platitudes and gets to the core of living authentically, challenging our assumptions and improving mental health with the guidance of good science, philosophy and learning from other people's lived experiences. And we're your hosts, Andy Leroy and Louise Poole. We started our mental health adventure in episode one of Reframe of Mind when we were both at what you'd call the emotionally pointy end of some life events. Yeah, your radio career of 26 years had ended and like any good breakup from a long-term relationship, there were lots of feelings, both residual and deeply rooted. And you'd not long lost your elderly father to cancer and were dealing with the associated grief and inevitable changes in family dynamics. Then we decided to make a podcasting business and realised all of those feelings that appear from day to day manifest with other masks in different parts of our lives and in work and business. Yep, that feeling of not being good enough certainly brought along an old friend, imposter syndrome. (laughs) 
<laughs> know it well. Mm-hmm. Most people do, unless you're one of the lucky 30% of the population that haven't experienced it. You have experienced it at some point in your career. Oh, yeah. And last time on Reframe of Mind, we met imposter syndrome expert Suzanne Mercier, who very nicely summed up what imposter syndrome is. It's a persistent belief that we're not good enough. So so some people feel that uh, that experience of not good enough when they are in a different area, they're doing a new job or something like that. So they're outside their comfort zone. But when they get used to the new job, then they've just expanded their comfort zone and they get to feel quite comfortable. Somebody who experiences the imposter syndrome feels that they just can't see why they've been given the opportunity or they're, they're just not able to internalize their success. So they remain uncomfortable. And so it's a persistent belief that they're not good enough. It's not there all the time. Mm. Uh, it, it's latent until something that causes them to feel uncertain occurs and then they react and then they're, or then they're triggered into feeling that they're not good enough. So it's, it's, it's something that they can be quite comfortable and quite confident one minute and then something happens in their external environment and they're suddenly feeling that they're not good enough and all the awful bits that go with that, which I've certainly experienced myself. Yes, imposter syndrome, it's pretty friendly with its counterparts as well, perfectionism and procrastination. And we're going to have a chat a little bit later on with Mr Hugh Kearns from the College of Medicine and Public Health at Flinders University about our experiences here. We might even have a new podcast to get you excited about. But our imposter syndrome journey isn't over quite yet. Andy, when's the first time you noticed imposter syndrome manifest for you? Pretty much any time that I've been appointed to a leadership role, I've got to be Mm -hmm. honest. You know, you go for the interviews, you're confident and you want the job and then you get it. And then the little voice inside your head says, yeah, but you were saying all the things they wanted you to say. You knew what they wanted you to say, so you just said it and you got the job. So now you've got to prove yourself. (laughs) (laughs) That voice sounds a lot like the devil from the skit up the top. Yeah, no, don't hold your breath, mate. Not going to succeed, eh? (laughs) (laughs) Um, So... I don't know. Then there's the two camps or the two theories. So you go, okay, I've got this job. I've now been elevated to the leader of the team that I was in. So people are going to challenge me and people say, yeah, 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 that's really hard because, you know, you have to take on a different role now. You actually got a different relationship to the team. So, you know, people are going to challenge you. And of course, you're going to feel like an imposter and feel like you don't know everything. But can I tell you something? Mm Mm-hmm. I've experienced that and I've also experienced walking in as a fresh manager into a new workplace and had exactly the same feelings because guess what, you've got people there who've been there for some years and they know everything too. Mm. It's like this little friend that goes wherever you decide to take it, wherever you decide to go, and it just doesn't leave you alone. It's always (laughs) tapping you on the shoulder. Hey, hey, what about that? Hey, 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 you don't know that. What would you know? In fact, you know, it manifested in my last job in a team meeting with other managers. We were tossing around ideas, and I thought, okay, well, I've been hired for the job. They want my opinion, and so I gave my opinion. And one of the other leaders said, well, no offence, but what would you know? Oh, they said that. They actually said that. That wasn't the voice in your head. So that little voice did decide this time to externalise itself into the mouth of an alpha douche. Oh, well, nothing like uh, someone saying that they don't think you're good enough to help back up those feelings that are inside your head, is there? Too right. (laughs) Also, (laughs) what what an awful colleague. I reckon the first time I noticed imposter syndrome was, um, I mean, I've been managing teams since I was quite young. I think the first time I was ever put in charge of a group of people, I was 21, 22. Um, Mm -hmm. And at that time, I had a lot of people who were older than me. And I I have in all the management jobs that I've had, obviously, when you're young and you've got people of all different ages and experiences you're in charge of. The imposter definitely creeps in and says, hey, these people have more experience than you. What do you know? Why are you in charge? Someone must have made a mistake or you've fooled them or one day they're going to work out that you actually don't know what you're doing. Yeah, so that's really been a thing for me to be conscious of. At first, I didn't know that anybody else felt that way. I thought it was all me. Um, It was unique to me. All about me because uh, I'm the one that's the fraud and everybody else, even the other people who are also my age, they know what they're doing. They have more skills or they've learned stuff or, you know, Hmm. whatever it might be. It wasn't until I started speaking to other managers about it that I realised I wasn't the only one. And that's hard too because first you've got to have another person in a management position that you actually trust enough to say, listen, I feel a bit like a fraud. 
Yeah. Uh, and, <laughs> and that's hard to find um, because people don't really talk about it. Well, they do now, I suppose. The, the imposter syndrome is becoming more prevalent in conversation. Well, kind of, because the conversation kind of goes, oh, you know, I just, some days I just feel like a fraud. And then the other person typically goes, yeah, yeah, me too. That's kind of normal. Anyway, let's go for coffee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a basic acknowledgement, yep, that is there, but there's never really kind of any deep exploration beyond that. It's like, oh, well, that's just that's just our mental health playing up on us, oh, playing tricks on us. That's just how we are. We're all just frauds hoping to We'd, figure it out. <laughs> we just need to carry on and pretend that it's not happening because, you know, it's, <laughs> it's not real. Um, also, you know, and feel free to edit this out as well. Go when, on. But... I do think a lot of these thoughts that cross our mind as well do come from some source that kind of validates them in so far as, I don't know, when you're in a team and you've got a manager and you're not the manager, there is this us and them thing. Mm. And so when we actually do succeed and become the leader or the manager, suddenly we know what everybody else has been saying about the last one. So <laughs> why wouldn't they be saying about us? <laughs> that's and why wouldn't true. it be true? Because that's what we feel about the last one ourselves. So yeah. it's just kind of this toxic little loop that goes on. But also outside of that, it can be completely unrelated to a team. It can be something if you are trying a new skill. It could even be if you're meeting a new group for the first time. Yeah, I don't think imposter syndrome has to refer refer to a work situation. No, I, think I don't think so either. it can refer to any of these situations where we feel like a fraud and we're going to be found out. Think about public speaking. Oh, yes. Wow. I think about that every time I'm on a Zoom call, I think. I think... Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you know as what we said earlier up I've done 26 years of public speaking but get me on a Zoom call and I'm like what if they realise that I don't know how to communicate yeah because they can see you up close because they can see me <laughs> they can see your nostrils flaring <laughs> they and they don't realise that you're just hot <laughs> what if they reali- What if I've got nothing to say I've, I've hosted things before you know in front of audiences or MC whatever it might be and I, I've had great feedback from it they go oh you've done a great job and I'm there the whole time going what if I run out of things to say what if I've got nothing to say I mean I don't actually know what I'm doing I don't know how to host this thing you've just given me a piece of paper with some talking points on it and I'm just reading them and then just kind of words are flying out of my mouth but I don't really know what I'm doing (laughs) and then when everybody says what a great job you did do you sometimes go yeah but were they really listening (laughs) oh they were just drunk (laughs) they They were just (laughs) clapping in the pauses (laughs) They were just there for Delta Goodrum, not me. They didn't care. <laughs> Louise who? <laughs> Who's that Ooh. woman with a piece of paper flapping around next to Delta Goodrum asking questions? <laughs> that was me. Um, that was me and I didn't know what I was doing. But I, I guess it looked like I did. Yeah. So either that or Delta was very polite and thinking, who is this? Who Look, is I'm this? I'm sure guy? she's very polite anyway, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure that wasn't why she was polite. <laughs> um, so, yeah, imposter syndrome, I think it can manifest everywhere and Suzanne, who we spoke to last episode, she regularly works with people to find their purpose and uses a checklist to help people identify whether they have potentially experienced that imposter syndrome or not. We tend to take things quite personally as well. And I say we because I was probably the biggest, (laughs) one of the biggest sufferers of the imposter syndrome. I have a 10 question checklist that I give people when uh, when we're talking about the imposter syndrome and I say anything over three and you've experienced it at some (laughs) stage. And I get up around the, uh, the nine. I did originally so um mm. and i remember talking at a conference and this woman saying oh i got 10 out of 10 i got 10 out of 10 and she was so excited and i said well at least you're in the right place <laughs> so the old checklist who doesn't love a quiz hey let's mm-hmm. do it so okay <laughs> I, I do think this is going to be a little dolly doctor here um andy mm-hmm. because it's a 10 question checklist and you've got to yeah. score yourself zero one two or three and add up the numbers I'm also aware this is a podcast and you can't see the questions, but I, I think if we if we read them out loud, you mm-hmm. can play along. And if you've got that pen and paper, you know, just write the answers down. But if you're driving or something, you know, we'll put this in the show notes later if you want to tweak, take the quiz for real. Yeah, definitely. The link's there in the show notes and you can access this quiz anytime you like. But um, okay, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, so one, zero is never... One Uh is rarely, two is often, and three is frequently. Mm -hmm. Question one, have you ever felt like a fake or a fraud in any area of your life? (laughs) I'd love to say never, but... um, (laughs) Often? (laughs) 
Often. <laughs> Often. <laughs> Hang on, I'm, 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 I'm going to write my results down so I can add mine up here too. So yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. 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 Simple, you've got to add them up at the end. Question okay, two. Ready? Question two. Mm-hmm. Have you ever felt that others don't see you as you truly are? Often. I'm going to say frequently. <laughs> Frequently. Okay, question three. If so, do you believe if they could really see you deep down, they might not like what they saw? Frequently. Often. No, frequently. Yeah, frequently. I mean, that's why we've we've made a whole podcast around that so far. Uh, I've made a whole <laughs> lifestyle out of it, so carry on. <laughs> question four. Do you ever feel as though you just don't fit in? <laughs> frequently. <laughs> Was Sue standing over my shoulder while she was writing this? <laughs> Has she heard my conversations with people? Often. <laughs> often, Suzanne, often. Uh, number five, when you have a meeting or presentation of some kind, do you take longer than you think you should to prepare? I'm going to that number two. See, I'm, I'm not going to go so highly on that because I think my procrastination likes to come in and do everything in the last minute. So um, I'm going to go rarely. If anything, yeah. it's like, you know, the old high school me that would go to um, debating and write her debate speech in the car on the way there. So that's how I yeah, live my life. See, for me, okay, so couple that with the feeling of when I've actually done it, I feel like actually someone could have done that in half the time I could have. Okay, yeah. That's how I usually feel when I've completed something. Like, yeah, yeah, I did it and uh, yeah, it's probably okay. But um, Joe Bloggs over there could have probably done that in oh, half yeah. the time and done a better job. Yeah. So, Of course, yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> Thank you for that. Me. <laughs> it's, I, think it's quite, I think it's quite common to feel like um, somebody else could have probably put more effort in and done a better job. Well, I often do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What are we up to? Question number six. Number six. If you make a mistake, do you feel you have failed even if it wasn't your fault? Frequently. You know what? I'm going to say rarely for that one. Really? Yeah, well, it took me a while to get to that position, but I have learned something in life, obviously, which, you know, is failure isn't something to be ashamed of, that oh. you don't always know all the answers. But really? um Yeah, I know. Fancy that. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you've had those breakthroughs with your therapist. Obviously, I need to bring Thank mine you. up next week. Okay. Uh, seven, <laughs> do you ever get upset when you receive negative feedback or feedback that you perceive to be negative? Says the person who yesterday we had a call with a business consultant this morning. <laughs> this morning I was on the teams to Andy going, <laughs> you're doing <tonight>, my work. <laughs> <laughs> And I was saying, I'm sensing that you took it a little bit personally. (laughs) So, often. I'm going to give that a rarely as well. And I only say that because, again, I think I've actually learnt from when I'm leading people that when feedback comes, it's got to be in the right way, though. Yeah. Um, I can always tell when it's malicious, but... In a professional context, I can generally tell and most of the time it's spent in good spirit. So I'm okay with that. I'm going to put a a one for that for me. Number eight, do you have a hard time asking for help because you think you should know how to do it yourself? Ten. (laughs) (laughs) I think we both know what my answer is going to be. Yeah, I'm a three on that one, definitely. Okay, question nine, are you a perfectionist? Do you focus on the ideal and the gap between the level at which you delivered and that ideal? (sighs) You know, I'm saying one oh. because because my little imposter voice says, no way, you're a perfectionist, mate. Oh. I know. Well, I'm saying three because I think I wrote and recorded most of the lines for the perfectionist in our skit at the top. <laughs> <laughs> and they came so easily, so, so easily. As did that voice. <laughs> I know. Sometimes it takes us time with the skits to kind of find the right voice. But, oh, no, we needed perfectionist. Bang. Hard work. Ha! She came right out. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Question 10. Have you objectively achieved success, a.k.a. others would say you were successful, and yet felt that your successes were unimportant or due to some external factor rather than your own talent, intelligence and experience? And for the showcase playoff, (laughs) Andy scores a three. So please add up your score and provide your total out of 30. I'm going to need both hands. Hang on. Shall we say it together on the count of three? Yes. Okay. Three, two, two, one. Three. (laughs) 26. 21. (laughs) 
Good news, though, Woo. Andy. It doesn't matter that you were slightly less impostery than me. We both feature in the frequent category. We do. 21, Congratulations. 21 to 30 is frequent. Uh, 11 to 20 is often. And 1 to 10 is rarely. So congratulations, fellow imposter. I thank you. And to you. I, I feel like that participant in Suzanne's seminar that time that got excited because she got 10 out of 10. I mean, whew. I've always loved scoring high on tests and quizzes, but this is probably one that I shouldn't get so excited about. I think it's just because you said you weren't a perfectionist that it hasn't bothered you you didn't score 30 out of 30. And also that you scored higher than me. Look, it's common, right? It's common. Yeah, 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 yeah. So now we've opened up the sealed section. We've found out that uh, inside the sealed section... We're a little bit messed up. Mm-hmm. What's what's next? What do we do now? Yeah, I kind of feel like Suzanne has already been so generous with her time for us that mm. it just wouldn't feel right to go and say, excuse me, um, <laughs> can, I, can, I, can, can we just talk about this? Um, <laughs> we need so to we, find someone else to give us our free therapy. Yeah, I think so. I think definitely it's a good idea for us to talk to someone else who can help us with what now looks like an imposter problem in our own camp, um, an imposter syndrome problem, that is. Mm -hmm. Mr Hugh Kearns from the College of Medicine and Public Health at Flinders University answered our call and gave us some more perspective on something he's called the imposter cycle. What people think, of course, is, you know, the the more successful you are, you won't feel it anymore. You know, we all talk about getting there. When I get there, I won't feel like that. But uh, that's not quite the way it works. And uh, I'll I'll explain it very briefly, I suppose. Mm. Let's say let's say you're doing a job at work, you know, in your work, whatever it might be. You you give a presentation at work and and you're a bit anxious about it, you know, because I don't know how it's going to go. Let's say you've done good work and someone says, we'd like you to give a talk to the team about that. So you're you're a bit worried about how it's going to go. So what you do is you prepare really well. You know, you work really hard and prepare really well. And, and you give the talk and, and it goes well. People say, well, well done. And you go, Whew, just got away with it that time. You know, that was, that was because I prepared so well. Uh, but then they say, well, that talk was so good. Uh, we'd like you to give it to our uh, state department or a state group or a state area. And you go, oh, now they're going to find out because now I'm going to be really exposed. So you work super hard. You work even 10 times harder now to prepare for the next talk. And, and you do really well. And you go, Phew, just managed to get away with it there. And they say, oh, well, that was so good. We'd like to give you a talk to our national group. And so now you're, you're getting really successful. All these plaudits and all these grades. But you're thinking now they're going to find out because now the stakes higher. Even more clever people are going to be there. So now you work 100 times harder to get it ready. And it goes well. And again, now you go to the international one. And so the, so the thing keeps going. You get more and more praise and awards and plaudits. But you're thinking, but I'm still just one step away. Because, of course, the standard just gets higher and higher and higher. And you think it was only because I worked hard to get through that whole thing. And, that, and that's why uh, often very successful people can feel like a fraud mm. because the standard just could keep going up wherever you go. And so that, that's the imposter cycle. And that's where people think once I, get, once I get to the next thing, I won't feel like that. But, of course, once you get there, it's, it's just like a, a good image, I suppose, is playing computer games. It's, it's like you move up to the next level. And so the next level is even a harder challenge and so forth. So so that's how that cycle works. Are we all just pretending that we know what we're doing all the time? No one actually knows? Uh, I, I think uh, a lot of us have the feeling that we are <laughs> pretending. Uh, we may not be, but uh, I suppose this is the the imposter syndrome thing, this idea that you feel like that, even if you do know. And, uh, you know, and, and, and all the evidence is that you do know what you're talking about. Most people, and this is a very fairly widespread thing most people will feeling hang i'm not so sure uh, maybe i'm just got away with it maybe i'm sneaking it through so uh it's not that people are pretending but that they feel that way and that's what now there are probably some people who are genuinely pretending but most of us um we know what we're doing but we have that sense i'm not quite so sure or maybe i just got away with it or maybe they'll find out and that that's really common for most people in in some circumstances uh, so it's fairly common i think so you don't have to worry that we're not all wandering around uh <laughs> frauds or con people, but a lot of people feel like that. I must say that when we were reading through your stuff, I felt very personally attacked. Uh, you're, you're calling me out very specifically on everything that I do and think and feel. You feel a bit seen, do you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Leaving yeah. things to the last minute, uh, 
over committing to things, hmm. procrastinating on stuff. Yep, it, it, it all resonates. Um, do you think as a collective group, almost everybody feels these things? Yeah, look, look my background is in psychology, really, and, and, and psychology of people who, who successful people who get things done. And, uh, and I've been doing that for the last 25 years. And uh, when you start talking to people uh, about their, their what they do and, and uh, what gets in the way, you know, a lot, an awful lot of people do overcommit, uh, even high achiever people, people procrastinate, have perfectionistic standards, all these things. And when you probe a little bit deeper with them and you talk about why they do these things or what gets in the way, then the imposter syndrome sort of keeps cropping up all the time. And, and that's how I got interested, really. It, it sort of uh, just it underlies a lot of our behaviours and those things that you're talking about that almost everybody else does as well. Um, are, and you wonder why we would do them. Why would we procrastinate? Why put things mm. off? Why uh, make yourself life hard for yourself in some way? And because, again, we all tend to think we're quite rational. You know, we would do things that were sensible in our interests, but often we don't. And so that's understanding a little bit the psychology of our behaviors. And that's where the imposter syndrome comes in. It's that sort of fear. Maybe if I do the thing, it won't work out so well. And so then we avoid or procrastinate or we have these extreme perfectionistic standards or or in some cases we overwork. You know, we do things 10 times harder than we need to just so we don't get found out. So yeah, it's very common. So procrastination, Andy, I think I'm the queen of procrastination. I thought I was the queen of procrastination. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still on my crown, bitch. I saw this meme once that says it's like I'm off playing all the side quests instead of the main story on video game. And <laughs> <laughs> I think that could very well sum up my life. It's not even that what I procrastinate with is necessarily bad. It's just not always in line with my true goals. I'd be lying if I said that I hadn't procrastinated at some point. I mean, you know, you've seen me leave things to the last minute, even with what we do. Different to the imposter voice, because the imposter voice says, oh, you're really shit at this. The procrastination voice says to me, oh, no, you've got this. This is easy. You can do that in a flash. You don't need to start that now. In fact, you could probably write this in five minutes. That's how good you are. So do you think it's the anti-imposter then? Oh, it's a strange bedfellow, isn't it? I think my inner procrastinator says to me, just... Just don't do this because if you don't do it, then you can't fail it. And if mm. you don't try, then you can't fail. Mine kind of says, if you do it, what are you going to do next? Because there's nothing else after this. So something that I put off all the time, you know, I, we've spoken with a lot of guests in making this. And from time to time, <laughs> from time to time, the story of Andy and his piano will turn up. Mm. Of how Andy started learning piano later in life and loves learning piano and is learning piano and can play the piano. All of that. At yeah. the piano. But I get to piano lesson day and sometimes I'll go, oh, maybe I should put it off another week because I haven't actually practiced. <laughs> <laughs> if I love playing it so much, why do I put it off? It's a good question. And there is that, there's this really difficult passage in this bit. It's it's too hard and I just need to leave it for a while. And oh, if I go there and I play this for Emilio, then he's just going to think, what are you doing? And, and he won't, mm. you know, like he's always very encouraging as you would hope a teacher to be. But there is that thing that this is something that I love to do. And yet I'm constantly putting it off. I'm delaying, I'm delaying the gratification a little bit too much. I wonder sometimes if um, I procrastinate on working on things because it isn't actually as meaningful to me as I think it should be, or if it's more of that psychological barrier, like fear of judgment that's stopping me. I mean, I love a hobby. I'll often start a hobby and mm -hmm. be very excited about it and then give up on it. I learned painting. You you were there when I started to learn how to paint with acrylics in Darwin. Remember, I came third place in the oh Darwin gosh. show that time with my swan. Yeah, and you know what? I've still got the painting you gave me when I left. Yeah, haven't yeah. painted in a decade. Of course I do. You haven't really? Mm, pretty much. I carry my paints like around from house to house, though. You should paint. I loved it. I really enjoyed it. I was even getting shown in it. virtual galleries at one point. No, wow. stop doing it. Don't know why. Um... Remember that accordion that I have that I started to learn to play? Hmm. Learned the basics. I could play songs by Pink on it. <laughs> Stop. Oh, oh. You see, that kind of mirrors, uh, that kind of mirrors, I think, young me, you know? Like, I don't even remember getting the opportunity to start very much, to be honest, because every time I said I wanted to start something, they'd be like, no, you're just going to give it up in, in two weeks. So yeah. just, no, 
do something else. Find something else. I want to. I want to learn how to play tennis. No, you don't want to learn how to play tennis. It's, it's going to cost a lot of money, and you'll just give it up out of disinterest mm. and you know, stuff like that. So then, in high school, I couldn't learn piano in high school because we didn't have a piano. Yeah, I've got it now though. Um, but. I took up saxophone Mm -hmm. in high school. I've got a saxophone in my shed I haven't played for nearly 30 years because (laughs) I don't think I was actually that interested in playing saxophone because, I don't know, I got into the school band. It pains me to say it, but the school band didn't sound very good. I didn't feel very motivated. He gave me the baritone sax to play and I felt like he gave me the baritone sax because I was fat. I don't know. I don't know what happens in my head sometimes. But anyway, I didn't practice the sax very much and I fingered what I needed to finger to make it look like I was playing, but I was the only baritone sax in the band, so Mm. it was pretty easy to Mm. figure out that I wasn't actually playing. I lost interest. This has nothing. Is the bottom line of that story. This has nothing to do with procrastination, but it does remind me of the time I faked playing the flute, and I just thought I've never <laughs> shared this with you. So <laughs> maybe you would like to know how, in I think year six or seven, um, I someone decided I should play a musical instrument, and they gave me the flute, which I thought I think they just gave me the flute because women play the flute, and I wasn't <laughs> at all interested in the flute. So I used to sit there like not obviously not in first or second chair or anything like that, and I used to just pretend I was playing boop, 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 and I'd move my fingers around until I could Did you make the little boop 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 noise? <laughs> 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 and then I think at some point my parents were like, oh, well, you're not interested in the flute. No, I wasn't. I was never interested. <laughs> I was, however, interested in percussion and drums. And I took that up in um, high school and, and played in the concert bands and used to love that. And then after school, like I played um, when I was li- living in Inverell, working at uh, Gem FM. And I uh, joined the Inverell Sapphire City Concert Band and played the Ooh. Glockenspiel for a few years. Oh, enjoyed a it. Percussion instrument for you. Yeah, yeah. loved it. Um, you think I've played in a band since? No. Why do things that make us happy? I, I guess also, you know, with with my piano thing, I I wanted to learn piano all of those years and was denied it for one reason or another. Yeah. I started to pick it up a little bit in high school and a little bit in my early years of university. But again, it was access to the instrument that I didn't have for regular practice. Yeah. But that passion was always there and I came back to it and I'm actually learning now and I'm you know able to play increasingly more complex things because the method that my piano teacher has got is excellent it builds up in in very small steps and it's not a method by which you you see a piece you nut it out you practice 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 that piece and that's the piece you play he's actually teaching me to sight read which is also what i wanted to do over all those years so i'm learning to sight read and play piano which is amazing even though i have that procrastination issue still it doesn't stop me completely from getting things done because i do go back to it and it's because of that passion it's because of something i'm really fond of and i really really want to do it's a, i feel like it's part of my purpose mm. not to go out and you know play for people in concert or anything like that but it's purposeful for me in that it it connects me a little bit to people from my past because my grandmother used to play piano and it also gives me joy to be able to play music and connect with music that way because I love music I love that about you I I think that the the, the fact that you pick up hobbies for the joy of doing a hobby is something that Mm. is so rare because I do think in the back of my head, I think, well, I can only do a hobby if I master it, Mm. if I make it make money or if I become a professional at it or whatever it might be. I think I procrastinate if I think that's taking too long or Mm. if, I I, I don't know, I I think, but that is definitely plays into my procrastination um, Mm -hmm. when it comes to those things because I start to get really good at art and then give up because if I get to the point where I'm showing it places and other people can see it and judge it and they may or may not like it. Um, You've seen some of of my pottery i have yes um, that's generally the reaction people have but i'm getting better at it you know <laughs> i'm doing it as for i me. say i'm 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 really <laughs> what i love about your pottery is that it brings you joy <laughs> thank you it does <laughs> that's that's my favorite thing about your pottery I, you know i'm probably the only potter who is currently thinking of a project for this term which basically is making a bunch of pots that I can actually submerge in the ground for the worms to enter and compost down my my (laughs) kitchen scraps. That's where my pottery lives. (laughs) In the ground? (laughs) 
So yes, definitely not just in a workplace do we feel like we are an imposter and then the procrastinator comes out. I mean, where does it all start? I, I can't remember how young I was the first time I put something off. It, it would have to have been somewhere. <laughs> it would have to be somewhere around one of the first times mum ever did my homework for me. And don't say your mum never did your homework for you. I don't remember mum doing homework, but I do remember my father once making an entire little electrical city with light bulbs and switches and stuff. And I submitted it for science and got an A and I didn't do That's any the of ticket. it. That's, That's the, the one? ticket. That's the ticket. Yeah, dioramas in my day. Because, yep. you know, we didn't have electricity then, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah yeah that kind of stuff I think it sets in early I don't know look I'm not a parent um, I can't say that parents necessarily transfer their competitiveness to win onto their kids but maybe they do or maybe they just are sick of getting notes from the teacher saying why hasn't Andrew done his homework it happened as late as year 12 for me I think or year 11, when my maths teacher sent a note home to my mum saying, Mrs. Leroy, can you please make sure Andrew does his maths homework every night and mm. make sure you sign off on it because we need to make sure that he's doing his homework. So are we procrastinating because we're not going to do it well enough or are we doing it because we're lazy? Are we doing a substandard job and getting called lazy and then never learning to improve because we keep giving ourselves negative reinforcement before we even start? What's going on? Ooh, wouldn't it be good to know? Hey, maybe we should talk to Hugh. Yeah, I think Hugh's got some answers. How young does it actually start? Because I can, listening to some of the, the things you've been saying in your talks and reading through the materials, it took me back to a time when I was in about second grade, which was only a few years ago. And we had a project to do for our class and I brought mine in. I was quite happy with what I'd done until I heard another kid saying, oh, mine's hacked. I'm going to get a really low mark. And so I felt the need then to kind of bring down my estimation of my own work and say, oh, well, mine's not that great either. Yeah, look, it, it, people often ask where, where does this come from or how do you get it and so forth. And, uh, you know, and uh, as with almost everything in psychology or everything about people, really, it's go back to your early years and that'll be the formative years for most people, which is in your early family years with parents and, and siblings but also in school that's where we pick up a lot of our things and in school and yours is a good example there it's about comparisons you know we compare ourselves with other people how am I going and generally we don't compare ourselves very well you know we're, we're trying to fit in we're trying to work out how to do it it'll be uh, often it'll be early uh, life and it'll be about how you learn how to get valued what's va what is valued how do you get to accept it how do you get loved and a lot of it will be uh, in the imposter syndrome it said comes to about mistakes but when you get things wrong how do people treat you you know if you make something get something wrong and people say oh that's very bad you know you, you you work out that's a dangerous thing to do and so then you work out better not make mistakes or better not get found out making mistakes or have reasons why these things haven't happened so it'll be very early in our life and uh, again uh, does that need to sort of fit in to feel you're okay and and, and largely because a lot of us feel we don't fit in or I, I don't some, some fit and there must be something wrong and so we try hard to overcome some of those things so yeah so a lot of it will go back to your to your early lives and uh, and then the, we, seem, we seem to spend the rest of our lives sort of uh, re, replaying those patterns or those behaviours and uh, working the way through. Now, uh, the good news is you can change some of those things as well. And that's what uh, psychology is, is helpful for. But yeah, it'll be pretty early in life. And uh, I have to say the education system is a, is a good way of reinforcing it because and, and it really doesn't matter whether you do well or not in education, because if you do well, let's say you come home with a good grade. Uh, people say, oh, well done. Uh, you, you're sort of pleased about that. But now you're thinking, now I have to do that every time. And maybe the next time I won't do it or, you know, the, the standard keeps rising. And if you don't do so well, well, you go, I'm not very clever. And then when you do get a good grade, it doesn't seem to make sense. And so you sort of feel uh, that whichever way you go, uh, hang on, that, that just got me through. But the next time I'm going to be in trouble. It's very common. I'm also starting to think in a bit of a broader context, too, because Australia at one point, probably even still, was fairly well known for the tall poppy syndrome, mm -hmm. where if somebody actually did achieve something, yeah. they were actually cut down pretty quickly to say, well, mm -hmm. who do you think you are? Don't think you're too good. Yeah, look, certainly uh, there's, there's no doubt there are cultural aspects of this. I run workshops all around the world in, in different countries, and, uh, and there are cultural differences about how you do these, things, what, how, how, it, how it affects people. And uh, yeah, here in Australia, that's the nice one, the tall poppy poppy syndrome that's the idea put your head up you're going to be the one chopped down so keep mm. your head down don't draw attention to yourself because, or don't promote yourself or even the phrase we talk about you don't have tickets on yourself you know look at me how great I am pretty dangerous thing to do because the minute you say that people go you're not really that good and so that's a sort of a social reinforcement of just sort of fit in don't be trying to make yourself too big and many other cultures have that as well I, I'm originally from Ireland and it's a very common culture there as well is you know don't be big headed just uh, keep your head down 
uh, the UK as well. Uh, I run this in the United States, and you demand, and there, you know, if you do something well, you're supposed to be very proud of it and be very happy. But um, ironically, the imposter syndrome was first described in the United States and it's very common there as well. And in some senses, it's a bit harder there because you're supposed to be confident, even though you might not feel that inside. So it's across many, many cultures and uh, that's the social reinforcement of it. And there are some cultures where it's even more extreme than that, uh, where especially in, in communities or cultures where it's more team-based, where it's a collective. And that's when you're not supposed to draw attention to yourself. You're supposed to share the glory around with all the team, but not draw attention to yourself. And that makes it hard then to actually acknowledge your own achievements because it's everybody else who helped you along that way. So yeah, so, so the tall poppy syndrome is, is a good example of it, uh, but it, it's widespread across all cultures. And, and I can't speak every culture, but a lot of the ones I've worked with, it's very common across there. Well, I mean, thanks Hugh for calling us out on our own imposter syndrome habits, I guess. <laughs> Ah, yep. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, well, look, I mean, we've said it before, we'll say it again, we've got form. Yes. <laughs> and at this point of the journey, because, you know, remember, we're actually recounting what's happened to us over the last 12 months as a part of this series. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, that's why I, we're able to I talk remember. about it. <laughs> that's why we're able to talk about it and not get triggered by it necessarily in the moment anyway. So at this point of our journey, um, when we were speaking to Hugh, we had episodes of a podcast called Elevating Experts, oh, all yes. made and ready to publish, but our little fingers weren't so trigger happy. And just to kind of fill you in a little bit on what Elevating Experts was actually is mm, it, it's, um, it, it it finally got up it's released it, it finally is there um it's a series of podcasts that we made for welcome change media which is you know our media business our empire <laughs> um to for which we wanted to be able to demonstrate the sorts of things that we can do as producers so we made a series of I don't know. How would you describe it? Though I guess they were kind of short, focused on yeah, short form how to make a podcast kind of information for creators, yeah, so that we could teach people to. our skills, and then they could come to us and go, "Yes, please, we'd love to hire you. You sound like you're experts." And look at that cue out the door. <laughs> <laughs> but but back to the actual point of of how he motivated us yeah. um his conversation did help us to unlock essentially what was a point of procrastination with yeah because we were sitting there when we spoke to hugh i think we had 13 or something episodes recorded ready mm. to publish and they'd just been sitting there for maybe three weeks at that stage mm. and we we kept coming in on a monday going is today the day we're going to publish no let's do something else oh no we've got to do this first we've got to get this ready and this ready and this ready and then after yeah. we spoke to hugh because he called us out we went okay <laughs> if we haven't done all these things that we said we're going to do by x date fuck it just hit publish anyway yeah and yeah, yeah we did because we, we hadn't did. done all those things that we kept putting in our way as blocks. And we hit publish. And now there's sort there's like 50-odd episodes of Elevating Experts up. Yeah, there is. You can hear them now. Um, if you go to welcomechangemedia.com.au and click on podcasts, you'll see it there with the others that we've made as well. And we had that, I think we had that procrastination slash perfectionism problem with all the things we've released. You know, mm. I think maybe least of all with reframe? I don't know. Because we'd already procrastinated the other three series. (laughs) Those other three series were the (laughs) procrastination for reframe. (laughs) Don't forget your procrastination of Willow Tree Manor though, please. Because we have another podcast out called Willow Tree Manor and it's like an eight episode satirical um, series. It's, it's It's a fiction series. It's something that Andy wrote on his own in the 90s and then yeah. got his own crew of people together in Adelaide to produce outside of Welcome Change Media about, what, four years ago? That was 2017. Yeah. And then when we, yeah. we started the business together, we said, Andy, we're going to publish your series. I know. And you know what? It was sitting there fully produced. And yeah. I was thinking, okay, well, yeah, I definitely want to put it out there because these people have put the effort into it. And, you know, I want to give them some return for it. It was just, it felt really hard. It felt really hard to do that. But we did it. And people are listening and enjoying it. And for that, I'm grateful. But um, we do have another podcast that we still haven't <laughs> released and remains unedited. Um. <laughs> The thing is about this one, like, okay, because because we are 
creative people. We um, mm. have a lot of things that we're interested in. So, you know, with your Willow Tree Manor, this was from you from a writing perspective and your kind of satirical fiction. When we have Elevating Experts, that's about us trying to share things that we know to help people. And Reframe mm. of Mind is kind of about us trying to share things that we learn from people to help our own mental health and be able to help other people at the same time. This other podcast that we started, we thought, I wonder what else we could get from our journey that we could teach people about. And we started to think, Mm. well, what about in actually starting a business, the things that people don't talk about, like all the epic times that you mess things up? A major contributor to the motivation to make it was someone we spoke to earlier on saying, you guys just should should leave the mic open because you're hilarious. I mean, we are, though. I mean, hello. Hello. (laughs) If we do say so ourselves. Um, so, yeah. so, okay, currently sitting in our OneDrive folder is about 10 episodes of a podcast called Brizzolade, the podcast, <laughs> which is like a behind the scenes look at what it's like to fail in business. Haven't edited it, haven't released it. It's been sitting there for close to a year. Yeah. Look, I mean, and maybe Brizzolade could be, you know, the podcast that we need as our next project to let off a bit of steam as we kind of go through the serious stuff with Reframe. Who knows? Should we play it? I know this is a series about mental health, but I, think I do we know think some things are a little bit play. funny. Um, and I think that what you've actually brought out, that the segment that you've actually brought to light is something that does reveal something about our imposter tendencies. Especially considering this was that we recorded this bit at almost exactly the same time as we spoke to Hugh, just before he called us out on on feeling like imposters. So without any further ado, here's an excerpt from Brizzolade, the podcast, for you to have a little listen to and to judge for yourself before we uh, hop back into the content with Hugh. Well, we've been talking up to this point in in past episodes about our formation of the business, things we're getting together, uh, different processes and how we communicate with our, our customers. So we thought it was vital it must have been very late one afternoon when <laughs> neither of us had had the sugar hit because suddenly we've got a document that tells us how we're going to use salutations in emails. We're going to mirror their language. We'll mirror their language. And then we and had we, that big debate over whether we use cheers or regards. Well, we didn't want to be too chummy up front <laughs> because, you know, the last thing you want to be is too familiar. <laughs> you don't want to be unbusinesslike. <laughs> We had like a must have been a half hour conversation on when we start an email. Do we say hi, hello, welcome, dear? dear. Hey. We're the podcast company that hadn't started a podcast, but we did spend an afternoon working out whether to say hi at the start of an email. And also how to close it because it's very important. You know, like the difference between someone saying kind regards and just regards. Oh, regards is mean. It's cruel. So we are a kind regards company. Uh, so some sample communications. It's actually the comms. It, it, when you're looking for this um, down the track, in the Louise, comms folder, it's in the branding section. Yeah. In the comms page. Okay, no worries. <clears throat> Salutations for email. The greeting is hi, first name. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you're well. Slash connecting phrase. If a gap between communications. <laughs> the ending is a simple kind regards or. In brackets, we can use cheers when the relationship supports this. (laughs) We spent an afternoon on this. (laughs) We well we we went into great detail because we we even looked at the option because some people do still use standard post. So when we're using post compared to an email when we say hi name, we'll actually say dear first name because it's a bit more formal when you're writing it by hand or typing it. (laughs) When we send a letter, we say we dear. Send a letter, we say yes. dear. <laughs> That's what you do. <laughs> uh, the ending, um, you know, we can use kind regards letter. for general in a letter. This yeah. is for post. Sorry, this is for standard letter. post. So you can end with a kind regards in general, or if you want to be a little bit more serious in your tone, you can say yours sincerely. <laughs> now, a note here in our style guide says with mirroring. <laughs> With mirroring, One if day. pitching, start more formal, then scale back when we know the person. <laughs> One, day. One day we're going to have an employee. Who's gonna be this? <laughs> uh, so is it too soon to scale back or am I scaling back too quickly? Um, oh, I don't know. How do I, how do, I do this? And we even thought of a great idea to explore this before we even start talking to them. Use a web form with open-ended questions to look at their communication style and mirror that back to them. And this future employee is going to... 
<laughs> he's going to have to take the training course on how to send an email. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, uh, Charisse, you actually wrote Dear Tom in an email. Um, that's your first warning. That's your first written warning. And it's on letter, so you can see here it says Dear Charisse. You've used the wrong font. I'm sorry, we're going to have to let you go. <laughs> Can I just say that anybody who is assuming Charisse is a female, I think you are just misgendering. <laughs> you need to look at our gender pronouns guide. We wrote that Thank too. you. <laughs> <laughs> the coup de grace of that afternoon, because we were very intently looking at these processes, these yes. communication processes, and we have to be serious if somebody, you know, makes a complaint. If someone doesn't like something we do... <laughs> Tears coming out of my eye. I know what to... I know what's coming and you... combined with what we just heard. I think I think we started off wanting to do this seriously with the gender prune. And then I don't know why we've written a guide to how to explain emails. <laughs> and and responding to a complaint that we haven't even come anywhere near making a product to get the complaint on. <laughs> But here it is. We wrote a complaint handling response, even though we haven't made anything for people to complain about. And look, I think it's a nice response. I think it... I just, no, I just, I just want to say that again so it settles in for anybody who's made it this far <laughs> in the podcast. We hadn't, at this point, made a single thing. Not even the <laughs> website. We hadn't made... Our Facebook page. We'd barely got our emails together. And we wrote a document (laughs) explaining how to respond to someone who complains about something we've made. (laughs) Just so we're clear. I'm proud of our work. This is the letter. Hi, name. (laughs) Thanks for reaching out to us about your concerns around concern. (laughs) Whilst we can appreciate some concepts and comments will not appeal to everyone's model of the world... We aim to make programming that does challenge the status quo, which can lead to some discomfort. Whilst we never set out with an intention to offend, we understand some people may not take kindly to what is being presented. Thank you for listening, and we hope you continue to enjoy our offerings. Regards. Um, I I think that would actually be a kind regards. Into that, I didn't finish that off. That's a slap on my wrist. I think, no, I think it's a regards at that point, because we... We've given them a firm, we don't care, but thanks. Well, this is, uh, see, mm, it depends on whether it's going back by email or in in, uh, hard copy. But um, if it's a post, I think it would be yours sincerely, (laughs) for sure. (laughs) So, yeah, I concur, it's a regards. And boy, are we proud. Boy, are we (laughs) We can hold our heads high and say, Brizzle the podcast, welcome behind the scenes. Really hit the mark. And that was Brizzolade, <laughs> the masterpiece of Brizzolade, in which, I, I don't know, it was just me giggling for six minutes because what was going on was so funny I was going to pee my pants. Well, you know, and, you know, true to form from commercial radio days, you were the woman. And <laughs> <laughs> I was the laugh track woman. You're the laugh track. There you go. And for that, I thank you. Okay, so let's go back into the conversation with Hugh where we tell him what we did. One of the first things that Louise and I did when we started this business less than 12 months ago was write a response to a complaint letter that we haven't even received and may never <laughs> received. <laughs> never received. Um, does it sometimes come down to what we expect for ourselves that stops us from moving forward? Yeah, well, well uh, uh, probably, again, from a psychology point of view, almost everything in life is about expectations. You know, if you if you have extreme expectations, you're probably always going to feel you fail. If you have low expectations, you're probably going to feel, you know, if, no matter what happens, it'll probably be better than that. And so certainly expectations. And uh, again, people usually have fairly unrealistic expectations, either unrealistically high or unrealistically low. And so so thinking about wh- how things are going to work out um, has that sort of danger. And uh, and that's even where even more complicated than that are we have our own expectations, but then we think, what do other people expect of us? And so we project onto them or we project theirs onto ours. And and that's sort of a losing game because we're just very bad at, project, at being aware of what other people think. And we will either set, put them high or low or whatever, but we, we generally don't get it very right. That's where, uh, yeah, <laughs> expecting complaints even before they start. You know, in some ways, it'll be good because when it happens, you'll be ready for it. But uh, the, the danger of that then is you don't want to take risks because, you know, what if they don't like it? You know, people are going to hate it. But equally, if you go in blind and think everyone's going to love it, and then you do get the complaint letter, you're going to be upset about that as well. So uh, I, I would say it's probably good to have the letter there, but also then realize, but hang on, 
might not happen. This is a sort of insurance policy if things go wrong. Well, we in, didn't, psychology, we didn't is write called, a, um... psychology is called uh, defensive pessimism. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's set out with su- set out with such low expectations that no matter what happens, it's going to be good by comparison. Excellent. Well, it just stands out to me that we didn't actually write a, a ready to go response for every time someone offers us praise instead of criticism. Yes, so. that's right. Yes, yeah. and and that's that's what would be more accurate, wouldn't it? Is look, mm. let's cover all bases here. If it goes wrong, we'll write this. If it goes well, we'll write this. How do we respond? So, but yeah, but again, uh, and uh, again, as with the um, imposter syndrome and um, the, the sub sabotage, uh, people ask why do we do this, and it's an evolutionary thing, really, because we, as human beings, we are programmed for survival. You know, it's fight or flight. If you hear a, br- a twig breaking in the woods, you know, a million years ago or whatever, hundred years ago. You had to worry that it was going to kill you. And so our, our, our whole evolutionary system is programmed for survival. And that is be, be worried about things. And so that's why, again, if you're going to take a risk like running your, a podcast or whatever, well, let's prepare for things going wrong. Because if it goes wrong, we might die. And so that's, that's sort of your, your evolutionary thing coming in. Whereas now, of course, there aren't any um, tigers in the, in the woods waiting to kill you. But we have sort of uh, more uh, vague threats. You know, people won't like us or people won't offer us opportunities. And so that's why, again, our brain goes, let's prepare for the worst here. So how does that fit into procrastination in this conversation then? Because if we don't try, we can't fail. Yeah, look, look, that's why, again, that's my other area of research, I suppose, is this idea of self-sabotage. And that, that's how we stop ourselves. And that's things like procrastination, overcommitment, all those. And how it works, and they're, they're tied nicely together, is uh, let's say someone asks you to give a talk or maybe do some writing. In, in the, my field, uh, a lot of writing, you know, we have to write reports or write uh, uh, assignments or a study. Uh, a study is a good example. Let's say, let's say you have an assignment due next Friday. Friday. And so, uh, and you know, this is a good, this is going to be great. It's going to be marked, and and they're going to decide whether you're clever or not, really. And so, what with procrastination, what happens is you leave the assignment until late on Thursday night, as late as you can, and then you pull an all nighter and hand the thing in at the very last minute. And then, if it doesn't go so well, you can say, well, well, what would you expect? I mean, I only started last night. If I had more time, I would have done really well. Because, of course, if you had started early and worked hard all the way through and it doesn't go so well, then we can only assume you're stupid because, you know, that's your best effort. But if you leave it at the last minute, you have the excuse. I, if I had more time, I could have done well. And so that's one of the reasons for procrastination. There are others as well. But that's one of the common ones is, you know, it, by, by leaving it at the last minute, oh, I, I, I could have done better. And, you know, students will always say that one. But we all do that as well. Whereas if you leave it last minute, I have an excuse. Things, if I, a, a very similar one is I was so busy. You know, I was so busy with all these things. That's why I couldn't do it. And so the deal is because if, if you gave it your best effort and it didn't work, there's always a risk. Well, that was a failure then, wasn't it? So, so the, the self-sabotage, these give you an excuse for things going wrong. Is there a healthy procrastination? Oh, yeah. Look, and, and again, to be kind to us all, when, when we are procrastinating, sometimes there are genuine reasons for that. You know, there might be, uh, there are some things in life that are just unpleasant, you know, and so we put those off for some reason. But uh, sometimes procrastination can be a little bit of a sign or a clue. And I remember working with one guy, he uh, he was studying medicine at uh, college, at university, and but he found it very hard to do his assignments, to do all his things and so forth and he just it, and uh, what what turned out really was he actually didn't want to do medicine at all he, he had done it because he got high grades at the high school his parents wanted him to do that but this wasn't what he wanted at all he actually wanted to go off and do some other area I can't remember what it was that's uh, uh, humanities or some other study like that that was what his passion was so he was being sort of forced into it and, and his procrastination was because deep down he knew this wasn't what he really wanted to do at all uh, so, so that can be a more positive which it is you begin to wonder is there something going on there is there some sort of deeper reason why you don't want to do this thing uh, some things are just inherently unpleasant uh, like doing your taxes or doing some audit whatever like that mm. most people don't sort of jump up and down and say oh, i'd love to do that you know they put it off and they put it off because it's difficult i can't find all the receipts you know it's going to be a pain and so you know you just realize some jobs are, are unpleasant uh, again like housework or the parts like that for many of us we don't like doing that and w- in which case then what you have to do is have routines okay i'll do it because i have to and you, you set up sort of routines and schedules for overcoming that. But yeah, sometimes procrastination can be a bit of a clue that maybe you're doing the wrong thing to start with or it's not what you should be doing. Is it ever a case of people are just being lazy or is it more the case that we're just trying to avoid negative emotions associated with things? I, I, I tend to avoid calling people lazy when I'm going to go people because I, I generally, I suppose, uh, in a kind way, whatever is, most people are trying to do the best they can and yeah. you know this is the way they've worked out how to manage it. And, and so then they may become lazy. But I, I think most people when they come out of the womb you know are are driven to want to do things that are nice and 
to achieve things and people want to do stuff. Uh, then over the course of life, things go wrong for people or things don't work out as well as they can or they get scared or fear. And then then their behavior looks like it's lazy and then maybe it will be. But I suppose there's reasons behind that. Like, why is that the case? What's going on? And, and I suppose being kind to the rest of humanity is some people have difficult lives. You know, they haven't had opportunities. Things have been hard for them. And so they and you think, why don't they do things? Well, maybe if you were in their circumstances, their shoes, you might respond in a similar way as well. So I suppose rather than just automatically say you're lazy, you generally you look, why would that be the case? You know, why is this person doing these things? And so sometimes we avoid things like that. So yeah, I, I, I would tend to view that approach rather than say mm-hmm. if you're lazy, but maybe understand why has have they come to that position or why is it like that for them? I was thinking that the lazy kind of is more a self-talk um, than yeah. an accusation against anybody else. Yeah, that's right. And and again, we're very critical of ourselves. Uh, and uh, ironically, even high achievers, people who are working super hard will say, oh, I should be doing more. I'm lazy. And it's a very sort of a pejorative term to use against yourself, you know, and, and it's it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult one because it's, it's not very specific. It's just, it's the general lazy thing. I should be doing more and sort of achieving more all the time uh, without being specific about what it is or even being realistic, hang on, what have you done already? So yeah, it's, it's an unhelpful term really in terms of that because it's sort of a, it's sort of beating yourself up uh, without being very clear about maybe there are circumstances why that's the case. If the procrastination is coming from a sense of overwhelmment, for example, what would be the best way to kind of crack through that? that that's a fairly common one as well is, you know, there, there's so much to do. And again, you see this in, uh, I see it in academia all the time. You know, students have uh, put things off and now it's so huge and there's only a few weeks left and I can't do it. And <laughs> you'd imagine working hard to be a solution. But of course, what people go, oh, it's not so hard. I can give up completely. You know, it becomes too much. And that happens for all of us in life. You know, the, the to-do list is so long. Oh, I'm just giving up. <laughs> uh, again, in, in business, our project management is called, it's called slip hysteria. It means the project has slipped so far, we might as well just laugh. You know, we can't even do anything. It's not possible. I'm never going to do it at all. So I suppose when you get to that, as with everything else, it's uh, the, the solution is let's break it down to small little pieces. Let's make a start. Because generally overwhelmed means you're looking at the top of the mountain. It's, oh, it's so big. What you have to do then is let's forget about that and focus on step one, step two, make those, and then we move on to the next little part as well. So so, so feeling overwhelmed or feeling crazy about it doesn't really help very much. Okay, the normal enough reaction, but now what do we do? We, we make step one and we get a start with this job. So is it useful then to kind of have a bit of a look at who the best judge of what failure is? Maybe it's a bit of a clumsy way of putting it, but worst case scenario, if this project fails and we don't make money, then worst case scenario is the bank could foreclose, homelessness, that kind of thing. And the realistic nature of those sorts of things? Uh, for, for anybody in life, it's probably good to have a plan B. You know, like, let's say we do this thing. What if it doesn't work? Well, actually, I have another fallback position. I can do something else. We can get our money, whatever. Because if there's no plan B, like if you if you take a risk and the whole thing falls apart, that there's a lot of pressure on at that point. And, and in some sense, the pressure is good. It makes you work, but also it's a bit scary. And so then you are, will you take a risk? Will you do things? Because this could be, this could be the end of the world. So my view is it's probably good to have a plan B, which is, well, yeah, if that doesn't work, we can, can manage another way. It might not be the best, but we can manage it in some way. So if this fails, well, hang on, we have something else we can fall back on along that way. Instead of failure, the, the way I'd, I'd view it, let's say you do something new. Uh, if it doesn't work, Okay, it wasn't what we expected, but we can do something else with it, or we can re we can reimagine it or see it in a different way or something like that. Rather, failure the failure word, I suppose, tends to be a final failure. There is no comeback from it. Like it is the end; it's doomed. And generally, life isn't like that. You know, if this doesn't work, yeah, well, we can do something else, and we'll have a plan B, or we work our way around that sort of thing. And I suppose that's where a more sensible approach would be: is yeah, look, give it your best shot, but realize if it doesn't work there'll be something else it sounds like we're really still trying to run away from that tiger doesn't it i suppose yeah that's right yeah and uh, and again i suppose you hear this all the time we tend to to focus on either success or failure it's either you win or you lose and again sports sees this all the time and of course the reality like in, in football or in any sport Generally, there's only one winner. You know, what about all the other people? They're not failures. You know, they've actually done the best they can. If you set it up like that, only one person can win. What about all the others? Well, and so generally, there's a whole range in between success and failure. There's people who've done well, and there's I could do better, and so forth. So I think it's helpful to see it more like that rather than absolutes, yes or no, or failure or not. It's usually there's some good things, some bad things, and how can we work along from there? And again, that's I suppose going back to your question about uh, the, the running from the tiger. Yeah, it was either you. 
you, you fight or flight, I either die or I survive. And the reality is, no, there's probably a whole range in between, which is more fortunate, I think. It isn't, uh, it isn't absolute every time. So here we are at the end of episode nine, Reframe of Mind. Mm, facing off against our own inner imposters. Um, we've also started to get some feedback on what we've been doing. Yeah, from friends and from the guests who um, you're hearing us speak to, also in the form of Apple Podcast Reviews. Please leave us a review before you swipe onto your next podcast or task. They do help us grow. We love them. They make us do a happy dance every time we see one, as long as it's, you know, not one star. If you want to leave that, (laughs) why are you still here? But go away. So, you know, we're almost at dual parts on this podcast now because while we're talking about events in our lives over the last year, we're now meeting, greeting and beating all of those inner imposters along our current journey. Like how dare we share our personal stories? Oh, I know. And you know what? Who's actually interested in listening to us? I think what we're sharing is so deeply personal. The idea of going out and publicising it now? (gasps) Big trigger for the inner imposter. Hello, front page photo. (laughs) You know what? We did get a um, a front page photo in... uh, local magazine and I it, it was out the front of my woolies and I <laughs> and so when I went to go get some cat food I picked up the front page of the local paper with my face on it and then went into woolies and we um, had no idea it was going to be front no page for which idea. we are really grateful but and considering you might have done your hair differently that day. The, considering the headline was, um, you know, something like Louise shares deepest, <laughs> darkest secrets. I'm very glad I was wearing a COVID mask and I had my unbrushed, unwashed hair, no bra fucking look with my T-shirt dress that might as well be a nighty. Um, you wouldn't have been able to tell it was me. I was um, I was definitely in stealth mode. You, you know what? Though? You know what actually really amuses me about this this whole publicity thing mm. is how a month or two back, when we sent out exactly the same story without the salacious headline, the sound of crickets from the publicity <laughs> point of view was deafening. Look, we knew if we wanted to bring people into the full conversation about mental health, then we needed to be prepared to tell people about what we're doing. Um, in doing that, though, we did discover that message needed to be crafted in that salacious way because we tried to send the press releases saying hey we've made a new podcast about mental health we hope it really helps people nothing nothing so what we did was we recrafted the subject line into former top rated radio host opens up about depression ding 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 <laughs> I mean, it got the eyes in publications. Yeah. And um, for that, we're grateful. We needed to incorporate the drama, the drama, Henny, to make people read and want to talk about what was actually just the same story. Uh, Yeah, pretty much. People love a bit of drama. So, you know, instead of feeling like an imposter or that nobody cares, we just needed to adjust our approach and make sure people take notice, bring more people into the conversation, however we bring them there. So having found a way to combat that inner imposter syndrome that does pop up whenever it gets the chance and finding a way to live and work authentically and trusting our own capabilities more leaves us with the question, what do we do when the imposter is gone? Who's left standing there and and who do we want to be and what kind of traits and behaviours do we want to model? So next time on Reframe of Mind, we'll speak to someone who has instantly gained our respect and inspired us with the work she's done in her career and life. Diversity trans relator, educator, speaker and coach Sally Goldner AM joins us to talk about diversity in leadership. I didn't feel I valued myself for the first 29 and a half years of my life up until 27 April 1995, which was the first time I ever heard the word transgender. And at that point I realised was I thought, I've gone a long way down by fighting this thing, being gender. I wonder what would happen if I went with it. You've been hearing our story and now we really want to hear yours. Connect with at Reframe of Mind on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok and Twitter. Or connect with at Welcome Change Media on LinkedIn. You can also contact us via reframeofmind.com.au with your stories or suggestions for future topics. We'd like to thank today's guests for sharing their personal stories and insights. And for more information on any of the subjects, guests or references used in this episode, please see our show notes or reframeofmind.com.au. Reframe of Mind is a Welcome Change Media production.